VG Naidu. And uh, it uh, fell onto me uh, rather uh, belatedly that I will chair this uh, G Echo session. Uh, I Hopefully, Prof. Uh, Sandy, uh, like Thompson, will uh, join a bit uh, later. Um, so this uh, session is looking at endoscopic uh, scoring systems in IBD. And our presenter for this afternoon is Sean from Durban. So uh, without uh, further ado, I'm sure we all want to uh, finish up as early as we can so we can have our supper. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Sean. So Sean, do you want to start your screen sharing? Yeah, thanks, AJ. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Uh, yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this afternoon session, as you alluded to, is endoscopic scoring systems in inflammatory bowel disease. I'll take you through a uh, little bit of why we do it, and uh, we'll go through the major scoring systems that's currently uh, available to us and uh, how they differ. So endoscopy is, uh, assessment is currently the criterion standard for both diagnosis and assessment of mucosal disease activity. It affords us the ability to assist with prognosis as well as monitoring for dysplasia um, in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And it further allows us to assess for a response to clinical therapy. We look at the history of endoscopy over the years. In the 1940s, it started off with rigid sigmoidoscopy to Trulov and Witz in the 1950s, having a simple scoring system um, for their patients that had colitis. Later, the Barron Index was developed in 1964. And quite a few years later, in 1987, the Mayo Endoscopic uh, Scoring Index was developed for assessment of patients with colitis. And if you go around the path of ulcerative colitis, it wasn't until 2012 that a, a newer scoring system, the of Colitis Endoscopic Index of Severity, um, was developed to assist with uh, further prognostication in those patients. Regarding color, um, Crohn's disease, um, soon after the Mayo Endoscopic Score, the Crohn's disease endoscopic index of severity was developed, um, followed by the Radgate score, and that was later modified in 2004, the simplified score. And then these are the scoring systems that we currently um, have available to us in our current setting. So why are they important? It's because targets have changed over time with the development and improvement in endoscopic uh, scoring systems and visualization due to technology. And this has allowed us new targets for therapy. And the target was then defined as treating all patients with high risks for disease progression early. And the goal here was to prevent or limit intestinal injury or disability. And then endoscope was deemed the tool to assess for both remission and because of healing in these patients. So the International Organization for the Study of Inflammatory Bowel Disease in 2015, first uh, put together the, the STRIDE committee, which is the Selecting Therapeutic Targets in Inflammatory Bowel Disease. And the STRIDE one set out a uh, set of um, suggested guidelines or goals for the management and follow-up of patients with both ulcerative colitis, as well as those with um, Crohn's disease. And in ulcerative colitis, we look in the, uh, the clinical patient reported outcomes was that of resolution of rectal bleeding and diarrhea, but also endoscopically having a Mayo endoscopic score of originally zero to one and later modified to an endoscopic score of zero and the ulcerative colitis endoscopic index of less than one um, to suggest because of healing and the added adjuncts of histological remission. With Crohn's disease, those patient uh, clinical reported outcomes was both a resolution of the abdominal pain and diarrhea, but endoscopic remission of ulceration in those patients and a simplified endoscopic score of less than three with a subscore of zero indicating mucosal healing was suggested um, by the STRIDE committee. This uh, diagram uh, is a quick uh, look at what STRIDE 2 in recently um, tried to uh, put forward for your targets for 
patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And you can see that the STRIDE committee has broken those targets into both short-term, intermediate, and long-term targets. The endoscopy is used in, in both the short and intermediate targets. Its emphasis was in its role um, in the long-term targets being set at endoscopic healing with normalization of quality of life. And again, the uh, adjunct of possible histological healing. So you can see endoscopy, endoscopy um, and the visualization of the mucosa is a quite important role for the management of these patients as set out by the strike um, two um, criteria. So in Crohn's disease, what you want to find is absence of ulceration. And in ulcerative colitis, you want to have this resolution of variability. And the tools for doing uh, that and assisting you um, with determining this is the use of colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy or iliocolonoscopy in those patients that underwent some form of surgical resection or intervention. However, currently there's no validated definition for endoscopic uh, mucosal remission in most of these scoring systems. But what endoscopic scoring systems do add to therapy is that you have uniformity in reporting. It gives objectivity with assessing the mucosa. It aids standardization with the reporting of mucosal appearance. And again, clinical uh, decision-making can be augmented as you can go from your patient not achieving short-term targets to reevaluate um, a patient for their long-term targets and vice versa. So if you look at the endoscopic scores in ulcerative uh, colitis that has currently um, been used in studies, the first first score to address these key points was the Pau Tuck score, which was first published in 1978. This is a three-point score, and the variables that they looked at was predominantly mucosal bleeding, but no endoscopic um, score was given or suggested for healing or remission. The Sutherland Index or Ulcerative Colitis Disease Activity Index was a four-point scale developed five years later. And yes, specifically, they looked at the mucosal appearance, but again, no um, endoscopic score was uh, put forward to suggest emission. Rachmilovitz um, developed a score with four variables um, with an absolute score between zero and 12. And then for the first time in 89, they looked at both vascular pattern, granularity, and still mucosal friability. But they also suggested a cumulative score of less than four uh, is comparative with endoscopic healing. The original Barron score that was developed in 64 was later modified in 2005. And they took it one step further with a five point scale where they looked at points of bleeding and allocated a degree of whether it was moderate or severe, including both nodularity, friability, granular appearance and the presence of ulcers. And they suggested that an improvement in the grade by two scales down or healing was a cumulative score of zero. Currently, the most common scores used uh, for assessment, endoscopic assessment in ulcerative colitis is the Mayo endoscopic score, originally developed in 87 and later modified in 2007. And it's a simple score. It's a four-point scale that ranges from zero to three. And its primary variables is there of inflammation, looking at the friability of the mucosa, presence of bleeding, looking for ulcers, and assessing the vascular pattern. Endoscopic healing was reported as a Mayo um, endoscopic score of zero or one. However, the ACT trial, ACT one trial, suggested that a score of zero was comparable with a 50% reduction in colectomy rate at both one and three years post uh, follow up. As mentioned later in 2012, the ulcerative colitis endoscopic index of severity was developed, and this was to address um, shortcomings with regards to the Mayo endoscopic score, especially with regards to mucosal appearance and the presence of bleeding. It had three grades. The three grades had four subgrades, but it was a cumulative score. And the variables that it looked at was the presence of bleeding, erosions, and houses with elimination of the friability, which is key to um, a endoscopic score. And they suggested an endoscopic healing of a U size of less than one to be um, significant in that patient. Another scoring system that has been that has taken traction in the last five years is the ulcerative colitis colonoscopic index of severity. Also a four-point scale, but they added a global five-segment assessment to the vascular pattern, bleeding, granularity, and ulcers. But there is no endpoint set for what is the endoscopic healing within that score scoring system. So if you take a closer look at the ulcerative colitis endoscopic index of severity, you can see that 
in this table, we have our three variables of both the vascular pattern, trends of bleeding, trends of erosion, or so ulceration. And it's a numeric uh, scale that is allocated um, to each one of these components. So you either have normal pattern with clear defined capillaries as your vascular pattern, and then numerically a score is added um, with, with regards to the abnormality as detected. So either it's patchy obliteration of the vascular pattern or it's completely obliterated. Regarding bleeding, you can either have no bleeding, and again, numerically, uh, a value is allocated with the degree of bleeding. If it's localized to the mucosa, if it's mild bleeding within the lumen, or if it's frank oozing. And the same goes for ulcers, but ulcers was defined, erosion in ulcers was defined based on the size of the defect and the depth. So the erosions if were present, but the less than five millimeter defects will get a score of one. Superficial ulcers would be a larger defect of more than five and then deep um, ulcers would get the higher score. So once you've allocated the score to both the vascular pattern, the bleeding and the presence of erosions, ulcerations, cumulative score would then be taken and that would be the um, ulcerative colitis endoscopic inner severity total score for that patient at endoscopy. This is, just, this is a visual uh, representation of uh, what I just said and you can Look at the images regarding to the vascular pattern. You can see the first image there that, that looks, uh, the first image that uh, has a normal appearance with its normal trabecular um, form of its blood vessels. And then as the blood vessels loses its normal appearance to be completely obliterated, that score is then increased. With regards to the bleeding, again, you can see that the bleeding at a mucosal level um, it's just small visualized uh, bleeding, luminal mild bleeding, and then moderate frank bleeding, um, which is pretty quite clear and obvious to the endoscopist. Same goes for the presence of erosions and superficial um, ulcers in that particular scoring system. Now, the major endoscopic uh, index of severity or major endoscopic score. Uh, is the most widely used endoscopic score currently by endoscopists for the assessment in patients with ulcerative colitis. Now, if we go through this uh, particular diagram, a male zero is both uh, the images A, B, and C in this diagram. They all refer, um, refer to the different aspects of what is a male zero score, whereas A is a completely normal colon with your normal um, flowing of your capillary blades at the mucosa, B, exactly the same uh, picture. And then in C, this is a patient that has had healing with some scarring that you can see. But again, there's normal uh, capillary blood vessels in the background. And Mayo 1 uh, score, which looks at um, hyperemia and the presence of erythema, is reflected in images D, E, and F. If you look at images D and E, you can see that there's erythema in D. In E, the vascular pattern is... Um, is abnormal, it's not quite as clear um, as that in image A. And if you look at uh, image F, you can again see that there's normal patches of normal vascular pattern um, with some um, areas of erythema and abnormal blood vessels, so basically a combination of D and E. Um, and all three of those images, D, E, and F, would, would be equivalent to a Mayo endoscopic score of one. Regarding Mayo endoscopic score two, this is the presence of a granular appearance as well as um, the presence of um, mucosal um, erythema or mild mucosal um, bleeding. So image G, if you can look at that, you can see that the vascular pattern is completely absent and there's presence of erosions in both images G, H, and I. And then a Mayo endoscopic score of three is whether you have the images J and K, where you can see that there's deep uh, um, ulceration, superficial ulcerations um, that's present, and then L with luminal um, hemorrhage that's present. So any combination of that on its own would then be a Mayo endoscopic score of three. So we take a closer look, we look at this particular image here. Um, of the colon, you can see that there's there's no erythema in this uh, image. The vascular pattern is completely normal. There's no granularity or friability. There's no mucosal bleeding and there's no ulcers. So that would equate to a Mayo endoscopic score of zero. If you look at this particular image, the, the normal vascular pattern 
has been lost in the background. There's a bit more erythema present, but there's no granularity. There's no real friability of that mucosa. There's no mucosal bleeding, and there's no ulcers present here. And this would then equate to a major endoscopic score of one. This particular image over here shows complete loss of that uh, normal vascular pattern as in the first example. There's more granularity that's present. You can see that there's mucosal, uh, some mucosal bleeding, but there's no clear um, ulcers that you can see. And the surface has a granular appearance, in, appearance interspersed with the erosions that is present. And that would be equivalent to a myoendoscopic score of two. And that granular appearance interspersed with the erosions and some mucosal bleeding is what is often to referred to as the so-called friability of the mucosa. And in this image, you can clearly see that this is abnormal mucosa. There's lots of friability to uh, this mucosa. There's a linear ulcer and there's mucosal bleeding. That's an endoscopic uh, score of three. So the main endoscopic score was modified to improve its uh, validity uh, across uh, um, various inter um, users. And first thing that they did to the myoendoscopic score, the modified myoendoscopic score, was to divide the colon into five segments. So if you look at the image on the right, the from anal to, to oral, the colon is divided into the rectum, the sigmoid, the descending colon, transverse colon, and the ascending colon. The first uh, part of the modified score is any degree of friability in any of the segments would automatically upgrade that score to a major endoscopic score of two within that segment. However, your the for each segment, the endoscopist is required to assess um, whether there is presence of disease or not. So you need to have a major endoscopic score for um, both uh, for each segment. And then the distent or maximum extent of the inflammation is then calculated um, when you are in that uh, segment and that's recorded in decimeters. You then take the total uh, of the major endoscopic score in the five segments, you add it up, multiply it by the maximum extent, and then you divide it um, over five and you get a, um, and you get a value. And this value is um, is quite comparable with colectomy rates at both three and five years in a small uh, randomized trial. However, um, it is more tedious than this uh, than the major endoscopic score that we currently use. If you compare the two scoring systems, the major endoscopic score uh, system and the use size, you can see that the major endoscopic score has four clear dis uh, distinct classes. Whereas the ulcer colitis endoscopicness is continuous. Focus in the major endoscopic score is that of hyperemia with mucosal lesions, whereas USAIS has basically removed the priority and looks at vascular pattern lesions and the presence of bleeding. The range of the score is between 0 and 3 and 0 to 8 in USAIS, whereas mucosal healing is a score of either a major score of 0 or a major score of 1. Originally, you're not specified what is mucosal or endoscopic healing for the use size, but it is proposed that a score of less than three would suggest remission and a score of less than one, a cumulative score of less than one, which suggests uh, mucosal healing. And severe disease is, is well defined in both the scoring systems score of, of three or more in the major endoscopic score, or score of more than seven in the use size. The differences between the two is. The main endoscopic score is an easy score to remember. It's, it's uh, much lower, wider use in clinical practice. And the use as, as a newer scoring system that has more variables is not that frequently used, but it does have the value that it is more objective than the main endoscopic score. And it has a clear prognostic value as shown in validated um, uh, studies post the release of the scoring system. That's also of colitis. What about um, Crohn's disease. So currently the three commonest uh, scoring systems or more frequently used scoring systems in Crohn's disease is the Crohn's disease index of severity. Um, and here it assesses luminal Crohn's disease and it measures the variation with regards to endoscopic activity and mucosal healing. It assesses this whether the superficial and deep ulcers, whether it looks at the surface of the mucosa that's been affected by the disease. And then it also assesses for 
ulcerative and non-ulcerative stenosis. It's a cumulative score and it ranges from zero to 44. And the suggested uh, evidence for remission is a re reduction in baseline by three to five from the original score, though the sonic trial suggested that a 50% reduction from the index uh, score is suggestive of endoscopic remission. Quite a tedious score, it has a lot of uh, um, variables and takes a lot of time to complete. The simplified endoscopic score for Crohn's disease was then developed to sort of simplify the, um, the CDI score. So it looks at exactly the same uh, parameters as, as the um, CDIs, in other words, assessing luminal Crohn's disease um, and looking at its variations in the endoscopic activity. But its variables is, has been well defined. So it looks at the ulcer presence and its size, it looks at the surface that is affected by the ulcer, it looks at the surface that is affected by the disease itself, and it looks at any type of bowel um, narrowing. Again, a numeric, uh, cumulative numeric score of 0 to 60, but endoscopic uh, remission is suggested by a score of less than 3, and mucosal healing in uh, these patients is a score of 0. Then the Radgate score, the Radgate score is developed to assess for post-operative recurrence in Crohn's disease, and this is important to remember that it looks at the site of the ileocecal anastomosis, iliocolonic anastomosis. It's a five-scale uh, score ranging from I0 to I4, and I0 um, is indicative of mucosal um, healing in that um, particular patient. So the Crohn's disease endoscopic index of severity has, has six variables, um, and these six variables needs to be assessed in every segment of the colon that is visualized by the endoscopist. So the first of the variables is presence of ulcers. So if the ulcers, if there's deep ulcers present, then you get a new uh, numeric value allocated um, for their presence. If they're superficial, get a numeric value allocated. The next part is looking at the surface involved by the disease. And here, the endoscopist has to look at the surface of the segment that is being reviewed. So we're how much of the actual um, segment that is being visualized is involved with the disease, how much of that segment has ulcer in it. And then the second part is looking at surface involved by the ulcers. So the first part is which part of the segment has actual ulcers uh, or erythema in it. The first, second part is looking at the surface that is involving the ulcer itself, and you get a numeric value allocated to it. And then it looks at stenosis, so either ulcerated stenosis, and this can be anywhere along the colonic uh, pathway during endoscopy, or non-ulcerated um, stenosis. So for each of these parameters, score is allocated and you get a cumulative score um, for the patient. Now the simplified endoscopic score only looks at four variables. The first two is ulcers. And um, with regards to the ulcers, they it is it was better defined as to um, the type of ulcers. So the ulcer was either called aptus ulcers. And if it was between one and five millimeters, you would allocate one point um, for the presence of that ulcer. The large ulcer was defined as an ulcer between five and 20 millimeters, and you would then allocate two points for that. And then very large was more than 20 millimeters, and you'd get a three-point score to that. Regarding the ulcerated surface, it was again also well-defined, and it looked at the percentage of that segment that had ulcerated surface in it. So you would visualize the segment, and if it was less than 10% of that segment that had the ulcer in it, you would get it would allocate one point. If it was between 10 and 30% of that segment, two points would be allocated. And if it was more than 30% of the segment, then you would get three points allocated. The third um, descriptor is the actual affected surface of the segment. And you would look at whether it was more or less than 50% of the segment that you are currently visualizing, we would be between 50 and 75% of that segment and more than 75% of that segment. Um, and then regarding narrowing, which is the last uh, descriptor, narrowing was split into three um, subgroups. So it was either a single narrowing, but you were still able to pass the scope and you would allocate a single point. 
there's multiple narrowings, uh, but the scope was then still possible beyond each of these narrowings, and you get two points. And if it was not possible and it was Frank's analysis, you would get three points. So for each one of these descriptors in the simplified score, the maximum points that you could get, the maximal points that you could possibly get for um, each of these descriptors was three and the cumulative uh, points for the simplified and discopy score would then work out to 12 at its maximum um, for uh, patients that you're evaluating with Crohn's disease. Now, if you look at this endoscopic uh, image in front of us here, you can see that there's an ulcer, and that ulcer is, some, is somewhere between 10 and 20 millimeters in size, and it's covering just about 10% uh, of the surface, um, just more than 10% of the surface uh, of this visualized um, of where the ulcer is. And it's making up roughly almost 50% of the segment, but there's no narrowing. So this uh, uh, score would end up uh, being six as you allocated two points to um, both the size, the surface, and the, seg and the segment, but no points allocated because of, of the absence of narrowing. You can see in the distance over there that the uh, um, colon is distending well. When I mean, you look at this particular endoscopic, uh, image, you can see that this is a large ulcer. This ulcer is making up more than 30% of the visualized uh, surface of where the ulcer is present. The presence of disease involves more than 75% of the segment of colon that we're currently looking at. And if you look this uh, in the distance, I'm not sure if it uh, projects quite well, um, you can see that the lumen is starting um, to narrow. So this uh, particular image will, you would get three points for each segment, and you get a total um, CSCD score of 12. This particular example, you can see that there's aptus ulcers. Uh, they're quite small, they're less than five millimeters, and the ulcer surface is less than 10% um, of the affected uh, area, and it's making up less than 50% of the segment that's being visualized. This image is on a fold, but beyond, I think my word for it, beyond the fold, uh, um, there's no narrowing in this patient. So each of these uh, segments would then get a score of one, 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 and zero, and give you a cumulative score of three. What about the Radgitz grading for post-operative Crohn's? So in the Radgitz grading for post-operative Crohn's, five variables, whereas I0 tells you that there's no lesions within the neoterminal ileum. I1 is the presence of aptus ulcers, but it's clearly defined. It's less than five aptus ulcers um, indicates that this is an I1. An I2, however, is aptus ulcers, more than five aptus ulcers with a normal mucosa interspersed between them, or they sort of these skip areas with larger lesions. And the larger lesions are usually lesions or ulcers that is less than 10 millimeters. And these lesions can either be confined um, to the colonic uh, anastomosis. And if the lesion is confined to the colonic anastomosis, the modified I2, I2 becomes modified to an I2A. And if there's moderate lesions within the rest of the neoterminal ileum, in other words, more than five up to his ulcers with some erythema, it becomes an I2B. I3 is well defined as having diffuse aptus ileitis with extensively inflamed mucosa. And in an I4, is diffuse inflammation, there's large ulcers, there's nodules, and there's presence of stenosis, active disease. Okay, we look at this particular image in a patient that's had uh, colonic resection, neoterminal ileum, and you can see that there's absolutely no lesions present at this endoscopic view. And this, this is reflective of an I0. This particular endoscopic example, you can see to the left of the image, there's few aptus ulcers over there. There's few, there's only three of them present, so it's less than five, and there's no other lesion, so this would be an I1. These two images, first pay attention to image A. This is a lesion that is confined to the anastomosis, um, and you can see it's a large, you know, near circular um, ulcer that is under um, leo um, colonic uh, anastomosis with associated um, erythema, and that would be classified as an I2A. 
whereas image B is in the new terminal ILM. And you can see on the top of the image, there's at least five small um, actors houses at the top and three smaller houses um, at the bottom of it. So it's clearly more than five um, small aptus houses. And that would also be an I2, but that would be an I2B um, as the disease is not um, defined or confined to the iliocolonic anastomosis. In this particular image, you can see that there's erythema uh, with diffuse aptus um, IIT. You can see that aptus also um, with erythema within the um, neoterminal ileum, and this is an I3. Um, and this particular image is clear narrowing um, at the anastomotic uh, site with diffuse erythema, uh, the surface mucosal bleeding with ulcerations um, in this particular patient. You can even see a smaller raptus ulcers um, in the bottom part of this endoscopic image. And this would be classified as a Rutgers I4. Now, small bowel capsule endoscopy scores do exist. They're quite new um, and they are available. And currently there's uh, only two scores um, that have been both used and validated. Um, they're quite a complex uh, scoring system. So, um, and the two that has been used is the lower score, which divides bowel into three equal parts, or so they call them third tiles, and this is as well as edema. Um, the score is, uh, is obtained from images at uh, capsule endoscopy. And the, it's a um, complex arithmetic that uh, needs to be done to get a, um, a score for uh, the Lewis score. The capsule endoscopy activity index or the NIF score um, had a bit uh, more defined uh, um, sub criteria. So there are three subgroups again, looking at inflammation, looking at extent of disease, looking at strictures. Again, some complex algebra needs to be done um, to get a final um, score for uh, the, both the NIV and the SECA die score. Um, they're not uh, very commonly used in clinical practice, so uh, um, but you can, I would suggest that the listeners go and read about them. I didn't really cover them uh, in the store, but they do exist. So in saying all of that with regards to endoscopy and all these different uh, endoscopic scores, um, that need to be recorded at endoscopy. The question then remains, what should be on the report? And it's important to remember that as an endoscopist doing endoscopy in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, when you do uh, um, your colonoscopes, sigmoidoscopes, or either colonoscopes, you want to achieve four goals in these patients. You should define the proximal margin of the disease and the distribution of the disease that you encounter. And you need to degrade the disease activity. And in respect of what scoring system you use, whether you use the CES CD score, whether you use the bioendoscopic uh, score, the UCI score, or the RATGET score in patients with post-operative uh, Crohn's disease, you need to be clear when you grade these scores, um, especially for uh, post-follow-up of these patients. And you need to try to assess whether the appearance is consistent with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. But this is not always possible in the acute setting of um, both uh, colitis and it might only become apparent later on, but you should at least uh, attempt to try and differentiate. And then you should always identify complications such as strictures, presence of masses and concealed neoplasia within your report uh, at endoscopy. So in conclusion, I'm, I'm gonna leave you with this uh, quote from, it's not mine, it's a quote from, um, from Limdi, and it states that the real world impact of rapid strides and artistic pursuits of meaningful targets, however, hinges on the universal adoption of clinical and endoscopic scoring systems within practice. It's only then that we will realize the virtues of such personalized medicine, which is exemplified by our urge to treat to target uh, approach. And I'm gonna leave it there and thank you for your time and open the floor to some questions. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm not sure if Chris is there, but uh, forgive me, I got waylaid on the way to this meeting. So um, I was meant to be nominally down to chair it. 
um, I caught the last uh, three quarters of it. So um, I have one question to start, start the ball rolling, and that is with all these endoscopic scoring systems and with um, the holy grail being endoscopic healing, how do you marry that with a reduction in the number of endoscopies? Because endoscopy is an expensive modality, especially if you're confirming histology um, in, in these uh, situations. So when is, is, are these scoring systems increasing the number of endoscopies necessary? Or what, what is the, the algorithm for when you should scope the patient once you've obviously established the disease and the diagnosis? Yeah, thanks, bro. The, um, it's not a, a easy answer to that question because yes, the, if you're going to apply all of these scoring systems, you you are leading yourself to frequent colonoscopies, and the important part should be that the endoscopist itself should familiarize themselves first and foremost with um, what is a Mayo endoscopic score of two. Um, what is a a um, say CD score of six? What what are the parameters that you're actually looking for? Um, so that when you go and uh, rescope a patient for either the evaluation for response to therapy um, at either eight or twelve weeks um, post initial diagnosis, you know exactly what you are looking for uh, to sort of minimize the amount of time that you're going to rescope uh, a patient. So the first part would be. Um, to upskill the endoscopes himself with recognizing what is um, abnormal and normal um, and with regards to what specifically you're going to look for um, in these patients. Um, the Striper um, 2 uh, committee did uh, allude to um, the need for endoscopic healing uh, and it all it opened up was having more and more endoscopies and how that would be managed. Um, so it was a concern with the with the working group um, when they suggested uh, um, the endoscopic healing as a as a endpoint target for um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so it was a concern, but again, when you're going to re repeat it, you're going to have to really um, if that first assessment and second assessment at follow up uh, after initial therapy um, is quite concise with what you're seeing. Um, and then that should guide you um, with regards to uh, how frequently you would uh, scope the patient in that setting. So in some ways, yeah, I, I find that whole, whole thing very interesting because it is, it is a costly exercise to do that and also a volume exercise when you do it. And obviously some in some ways, once the patient is stable, you're managing them without endoscopy. You're managing them based on their CRP or their calprotectin and uh, trying to avoid endoscopy. So it seems a bit of a catch-22, so to speak, to to, a, to an outsider and a simple surgeon. I don't know if any, VG, do you have any thoughts um, on uh, some of these uh, quandaries that, that the endoscopic scoring systems pose? Yeah, yeah. Uh, firstly, Sean, I appreciate the overview of uh, endoscopic scoring systems. Uh, I I think uh, with Crohn's disease, it's actually a little bit harder. I don't think in terms of our routine, uh, uh, everyday practice, when we scope somebody with Crohn's disease, do we actually uh, religiously score them? Um, what's fairly important, and I can understand how come, because the Crohn's disease scoring system is a bit of, you know, you'll be uh, trying to do your report and, and trying to work out a calculation. It does become a bit... Um, like you're tedious. Um, so I always emphasize, especially for Crohn's disease and also for ulcerative colitis to a, an extent as well, that you have to use your English uh, like sort of language and go through and describe the ulcers that you've seen, the location, the extent of them, uh, the shape of the ulcers, the morphology, subigenous, and obviously in our circumstances, we're also trying to distinguish endoscopically between Crohn's disease and intestinal uh, tuberculosis. Uh, how frequently should we scope them? Um, 
I think that is an area that is evolving. I don't think there's any clear consensus which I have seen on that. This, uh, up front, that uh, first scope, and I was always, uh, when I started out, was actually uh, told us that first scope that somebody does on an IBD uh, patient is, is usually the most important scope. It gives you uh, severity, tells you the extent of disease, uh, etc. Because after you institute any form of uh, like a treatment, that's going to alter um, completely. And um, so uh, uh, I think with intestinal ultrasound, fecal calpro, uh, you can safely go ahead and uh, do those. However, if the patient hasn't achieved clinical remission and your fecal cal protector is inconclusive or you aren't able to hold on for, for it, then I think you would probably want to have a relook and uh, scope to see that you're not dealing with IBS or some other effective etiology. Uh, we do not routinely repeat scopes on individuals who have achieved a clinical remission in Crohn's unless we are concerned about the, the development of a stricture or they had really severe Crohn's on that first scope and we are concerned that over time that they may, they're at high risk for developing uh, stricturing. Uh, and we may choose to have a relook there. So it really depends on the symptoms and uh, the fecal calpro and the you know, other indices like uh, CRP, et cetera. Uh, with ulcerative colitis, it's a little bit easier because, yes, that first scope gives you an idea of the extent of the disease. And, um, but subsequent to that, if you do need to go back and you relook because a patient is not uh, responding well or they have responded uh, uh, clinically, but their fecal calpro remains elevated and you don't have to do a full scope on those individuals. You can just do a quick look as sigmoid. Um, uh, and that should give you your endoscopic score to, and to say whether they have improved or if they haven't, or this may be uh, ulcerative colitis with an overlap of some you know, IBS. Um, so yeah, so with ulcerative colitis, it's actually a bit easier. And with ulcerative colitis, it's also Fiji, easier got, for them. Maybe, maybe we can see if anybody else has some questions, Fiji. Uh, that, that's, that's really good of, of, of you summarizing uh, at your level. That's uh, fantastic. I have um, perhaps one other question, and then I'd like to just see if there's any other comments. But um, what about, we've, we've heard of AI for adenoma detection. Where is AI with these uh, scoring systems? And is that coming? And when are we going to move? I see all the endoscopic companies are now um, converting to DICOM. So you'll be able to store all your videos now on your uh, your uh, hospital systems. So where are we with AI and where are we with routine video? Because then obviously you have a, a record and a reproducible record that you can go back to um, when you're scoping your patient next. So, so regarding AI, AI has not actually been included in any of the um, update recommendations at endoscopy. However, the modified uh, Mayo Index, uh, what they for you to assess a patient on a modified Mayo index, you have to both either short video document or uh, photo document those five segments um, of the colon at endoscopy. Um, so that then, so one of the suggestions was to improve time with the endoscopy was you would do the scopes, photo document um, uh, where you went. And then at the end of the scope slate, um, you would then go back to do the actual calculations um, with some of the algorithms. But yeah, it's not been included as part of um, the endoscopic scoring systems. There's none of none of the scoring systems actually have an, an AI algorithm. The the one um, video endoscopic score does have an AI algorithm uh, in it. So when the images are produced at video endoscopy, it actually gives you this little um, 
underscore attached uh, to it. And then all you have to do is then to go and uh, verify that the scores, that whatever the AI had picked up was there, but it hasn't been validated prof, um, for use in clinical practice, but it is there. And the, the one suggestion by um, the authors of the um, ulcerative colitis uh, um, endoscopic index uh, of severity was that um, short videos um, of segments should be um, recorded uh, and stored for uh, future relooks to sort of minimize the time. But uh, it was just, uh, it was suggested, it wasn't uh, um, a, um, that's a term look for a, uh, a recommendation uh, from them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Are you do are you routinely recording your your ulcerative colitis and UC patients in your practice? Not a, not not video recording. Uh, we try and photo document uh, um, as much as uh, um, where we can, um, and we always uh, we always tell us we must take pictures. Um, so yeah, um, but most of these pictures, and then we can take it from there. And we try and upload it onto the patient's uh, filing systems. Uh, if I can add the prof uh, video rec. Uh, to do a video re record, and it's actually a problem all over the world where people are saying we should video record, is storage space. Because after a year, you're going to you're gonna need a fair amount of storage for uh, video. Yes. I, th I think that most of the big units now and most of the endoscopes now will be DICOM compatible, the same as the X-rays. So I, I would imagine that, that the video storage is now on certainly in, in European countries and in America, is going to be on the, the PAC system and you'll be able to access it. So I don't think it will be such a problem. I think it is a problem just now. Uh, it's a big problem. Um, but again, it depends on the volume of your endoscopy practice and uh, exactly how that would be factored in. Chris, do you have any words of wisdom for, for the scoring systems? No, no, excellent, Sean. No, you covered most things. Thank you, Sean. I mean, AI is coming not only from an endoscomic mucosal point of view, but integrating um, the histology activity as well, which I think is, is very exciting. Um, just as far as calprotectin is concerned, I mean, that has changed the way we endoscope patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And watch out uh, for calprotectin when it comes to small bowel Crohn's. You can often... Uh, be let down, but I think there's good correlation between um, colonic IBD and fecal calpro. Uh, thanks, uh, EG, for taking care of the introduction and also your comments. Is there anyone else who has got some questions? I think we really have had, well, I've been treated to three quarters of it. And uh, thank you again, VG, for standing in for me. Um, I try usually to honor my commitment. Yeah, sorry, I was also late today. <laughs> yeah. uh, sure, no problem. I was here because uh, Sean was uh, speaking and he reminded me to be here. <laughs> yes, well, he's, I think you, you should be proud of your trainee. He did a good job. Um, <laughs> you, yeah, so, he nearly, uh, had, he nearly uh, had experience in chairing as well. <laughs> I think yes. we were we were we were asked by uh, Vikash to actually yes. specifically about it. Yeah, if Vikash is also a way. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think the reason why we were asked to to do this is there was some concern that the fellows were not from familiar with the endoscopic scoring uh, systems in IBD. So I think for the uh, Fellows, it is definitely worth uh, your reading over. And I think if you're in a uh, training, unit, and I'm assuming all of you are doing scopes uh, uh, every uh, like other day at least, um, you should try and score these patients, especially the ulcerative uh, colitis patients. It's fairly easy. And we do know there is inter-observer variability, and that is an issue. But it's more of an issue in those who are inexperienced Experience. As you develop experience with uh, scoring these patients into a um, Mayo 1 or Mayo 2, Mayo 3, uh, you will see that that inter-observer uh, variability becomes uh, uh, far less. So rehearse your scoring systems in real uh, time and preferably with a supervisor in the room. 
as well if you are if you are starting out so i think um we've come to an end um thank you very much to to everyone um especially um our speaker and uh just to remind us that um we are sort of hosted by echo india from the echo um platform and that these um this this talk today will be available on the gastro foundation website for those who missed it or want to refresh their memory on the scores and uh, i'd like to thank the the ladies as always in the background who are who are keeping us honest or trying to keep me honest and um thanks again to to the many people who who uh, who are responsible for helping us to put the the funding together to to run these sessions next week i believe is truly ibd and um what 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 better of a lead in than that to uh, the the realm of all these uh, biosimilars and other fancy uh, fancy drugs for the management of these uh, conditions so thanks again and i think uh, we call a close to the meeting thank you thanks sandy thanks everyone thanks